Cities are the culmination of globalization. Nowhere else in the world are conflicts as strongly concentrated as here. Cities are a behemoth and a savior, bustling with possibilities, yet vulnerable. Those wanting to harm a society ambush the city and its daily life. Cities are defenseless against this form of terrorism. Their inhabitants vulnerable. How do cities respond to this threat? And how does fear change our urban lifestyle? Cities are exciting to me. Cities are incredible. Cities are all of human life. They are sedimentations of all of human history. They are landscapes of power. London, once the heart of the British Empire. Along with New York and Hong Kong, still the center of the global financial industry. Symbol and driving force behind the international monetary flow. 12 million inhabitants, over 300 languages, countless ethnicities and cultures. London is a prototype of a global networked megacity and a laboratory for security measures. Well, a lot of the changes in cities since the 9-11 terror attacks in New York and Washington were already underway before those attacks. So it's important to just to sort of stress that the 9-11 attacks have led to certain changes intensifying that were already underway. Most importantly, I would say, there's an increasing preoccupation with security, as defined by the state, as defined by big companies, and as defined by those in government. Professor and author Stephen Graham teaches and researches on security and surveillance and the militarization of urban space. Cities are getting more into the focus of conflict this is not entirely new. Currently, however, this new context is, is leading to a, another sense of renewed emphasis on the city as a site of violence and conflict. Throughout history, walls have protected cities and their inhabitants. Now the walls have disappeared and borders are more open than ever. The enemy generally doesn't come from the outside. He's already here, living among us. The city is a fragile fabric, a vulnerable space. How can we protect ourselves against the invisible, the incomprehensible, against feelings of vulnerability? You can see two here of the original ones, a further one monitoring this vehicles coming up and down the street. Down the end, there are a further two hanging off the corner of that building. At the end of the street, another one. And then another two on the corner of that building. These are hanging globes. This building is one of my favorites. It's completely encrusted in CCTV, some of which is almost impossible to work out what it is for. You've got uh, one there monitoring the door. It's the service entrance. And you've got a globe which monitors the street. And then there is a fixed camera there which just seems to be looking straight at the ground and there is no door there. Uh, around the corner, we've got another pin one, which is coming out and looking at this traffic interchange, which has already been covered by that, and then another globe, which can obviously swing around and surveil the whole area. In fact, on the other side, there are even, you know, almost as many cameras again. All in all, just from this one spot, it's being watched by 16 CCTV cameras. Cartographer George Gengel and photographer Henrietta Williams discovered a disturbing pattern of security architecture in the middle of London. They realized they were moving in a kind of visual parallel city. Their findings developed into an art project. We called our project um, Ring of Steel, Entering the Panopticon, because we were really fascinated in this idea that when you're in the city of London, every movement um, is traced by cameras. 
In exhibitions and on the internet, Henrietta Williams and George Gingell showed a tight network of security cameras and structures. Clearly visible on a map, they are well camouflaged in real life. Empty and easily overlooked control booths. A tree in the middle of a street, surrounded by iron bollards. A tank barrier disguised as a pond. Together with the omnipresent security cameras, these structures form a security ring around the city of London. Remarkably enough, the modern ramparts follow almost the exact same lines of the old city walls dating back to Roman times. The ring of steel as a modern fortress, a matrix for other cities. The project about the Ring of Steel was primarily to make it visible so that people understood how to read the urban landscape. I think that's what I find most interesting about the Ring of Steel is because it was so key um, to not have this very visible defence. It is not like the Roman wall that where you can find it and see it very easily. So we really wanted to explain to people, like through mapping, through photographs and also through guided tours, um, how to find it and how to be able to analyse what you were looking at and to understand how the system was operating. 1993. A truck with 16 tonnes of explosives detonates in the city of London. The IRA attack brings terror to the capital and demonstrates to the British establishment, we can hit you right in the centre of your power. It's the worst of a series of attacks and a painful reminder of the city's vulnerability and helplessness. An act never to be repeated. Banks, administration and police resolve to implement a system of continuous monitoring of the city centre through limiting access routes, building checkpoints and installing countless surveillance cameras. Here we're standing by um, one of the checkpoints in the so-called Ring of Steel over here, um, which was established in the 1990s following some of the um, terrorist attacks by the Irish Republican Army on the finance core of London, the so-called city. Um, it was a, an effort to basically control access and to use the surveillance cameras, as you can see here, to create checkpoints around a smaller number of roads going into the, uh, the financial core of the city. And the idea is that you have an uh, automated system for registering and checking the number plates of all of the vehicles that are actually going in and out of the City of London. The system developed over 18 years and is now largely computer operated. Checkpoint controls are quite rare and random. Unpredictability is part of the system. A potential attacker should never feel safe. The electronic system sees everything and can seal off the financial district at a moment's notice. Increasingly people just take this for granted. People just assume that they are being digitally monitored, that they are creating um, a track of their everyday lives. People increasingly embrace that sometimes. It's important to stress that this is not some coercive big brother authoritarian state such as the, um, um, the GDR with the Stasi and a, a completely centralized system of monitoring political activity. But there are all sorts of different efforts to collect data for all sorts of different reasons, for all sorts of different geographical scales. And those data and those images don't all necessarily become centralised. So it's better to think of a thousand little brothers, if you like, than one Orwellian big brother society. More than 20 million traffic movements per day. Without an effective electronic management system, daily life in a megacity is impossible to organise cameras can be found even beyond the ring of steel. In taxis, buses and trains, for the toll system, the urban traffic control centre and the police. And of course, all 32 districts have cameras of their own. All told, there are well over 20,000 surveillance cameras in London.
We're living in the urban millennium. More than 50% of the world's 7 billion inhabitants now live in cities. The numbers are increasing. With their promise of jobs and prosperity, cities lure people from the surrounding areas. The cities become megacities, then evolve into urban landscapes. At the German Aerospace Institute in Berlin, technologies are being developed for effective mobility and safety in emerging urban landscapes. Martin Rue works in Berlin, but at any given moment he's online in the transport control system in Hefe. Hefe, capital of the Anhui province, with 5 million inhabitants, one of the most rapidly growing cities in China. The daily traffic demonstrates the problems inherent in the massive influx of newcomers. Despite all their oases of tranquility, more than 150 cities in China will have a population of some 5 million inhabitants by the year 2050. Without proper controls, this development threatens to cause supply and environmental problems, as well as social unrest. Together with our Chinese partners, we've equipped a fleet of taxis. Currently, 1,000 are part of the program. When we're finished, 10,000 automobiles will transmit their GPS positions to the central computer every second. From these individual reports, we can calculate the current speed that can be driven on the streets and can forecast how traffic will develop in the next half hour, for example. The taxis are always in motion. The system is dynamic and provides not only information on traffic conditions, any deviations from normal traffic patterns are also recorded seismographically. The system immediately recognizes congestions, disruptions in traffic flow, and latent threats to peace and order. In a lot of Chinese cities, automobile traffic is increasing astronomically. Traffic jams and the threat of gridlock are becoming a dire social problem. This is why we want to continue to develop our partnership with Germany. We accept our responsibility and want to take appropriate measures to actively push this project forward. In the future, we want to have means and measures for countering the gridlock threat. This will also help us find ways to gain the upper hand over the environmental pollution and climate change resulting from traffic. With the help of the German-Chinese project, each taxi movement can be monitored and directed online by the traffic control center. Perfect traffic management or total surveillance? Are taxi drivers becoming security agents? Who controls all of the data? And who has access to it? In the Middle Ages, it was said that city air liberates. This meant complete personal liberty in the anonymity of the city, in contrast to the narrowness of village life. But will we lose our urban freedom as our movements are increasingly recorded? How can we maintain the delicate balance between our desire for freedom and our need for security? Will the new conflict transform cities into digital fortresses? Cities have always been principal sites for targeting during warfare, going right back to the days of classical civilization, through medieval societies to the contemporary period. The crucial thing about this relationship today is that um, we are not seeing states mobilize against other states and their cities. We're seeing um, both in terms of the Western cities like London. We see 
military and state and police forces mobilized against people who blend into the city, who inhabit the city. The Berlin city center. Embassies are always heavily protected. But since the 9-11 attacks, high security architecture has become dominant and highly visible. Symbolic locations are potential targets. The Brandenburg Gate is a magnet for tourists. Right next door, the US Embassy. Here, security and public space still coexist. But in the future, will the security situation call for other solutions? Will potentially endangered buildings have to be conceived differently and outside the city center, like the new US Embassy in London? An entirely new embassy is going to be built at the cost of about $1 billion. The building looks almost exactly like a 21st century castle. It reminds me very, very much of the Norman keep as a sort of structure. It has a 30 meter moat filled with water, believe it or not, which is both a landscape feature, an aesthetic feature, and a security feature. And it involves a whole load of blast proofing architectures, a whole load of very intense security devices and systems, many of which are confidential, as you'd expect, um, built into this glass and steel, almost medieval castle-like structure. Are we witnessing a renaissance of medieval architecture with electronic city walls and bomb-proof moats? Fortresses have always had a dual function, protection from the outside, and for rulers, protection from their own subjects. Major events such as the G8 and G20 summits and the World Economic Forum demonstrate how the ruling classes are protecting themselves from their own citizens. Their security efforts are increasing from year to year. The distinction between police and military is blurring. At the 2009 G20 summit in Pittsburgh, a sound cannon developed for the military was used for the first time against the civilian population. This non-lethal weapon is ideal for urban landscapes, particularly for containing civilian protesters. The security industry is developing more and more devices which can be implemented in war and on the home front. Drones can be used for attacks and for urban surveillance. The Swiss capital, Bern, has always been a fortified city. Though more discreet and less visible today than during the period of city walls and towers. Bernhard Ebby and his partner Pascal Vincent have been developing architectural concepts for many years. In 2007 they were commissioned to reconstruct the Swiss parliament building. The most important requirements transparency and security. In all of his projects, Ebi is interested primarily in public space. I think far too little attention is paid to this in architectural projects today, not only in Switzerland, but also in other countries, because there's the building, which is a published object, and there's everything that happens around it, which no one seems to care about. But it's the public space that creates a sense of security in a city. The square in front of the parliament building is a former parking lot. The empty stone space feels like an enormous carpet. Today the square is a very lively and popular location where people enjoy lingering, relaxing or simply letting time pass by. You feel totally safe because you have an overview of everything. There are no spaces where you're not sure. 
May I go there? Will someone pop out from behind a car? I think this is very, very important in this day and age. With all the security requirements to imagine the terrorist attacks, no one wants this to happen, but if you're afraid it will, it's a horrible feeling. The design of public spaces is very important in making people feel safe. Everything here appears relaxed, but the whole area is very discreetly and extremely well secured. Beneath the square lie enormous vaults housing the gold reserves of the Swiss National Bank. The parliament building is in the middle of the city. There's no demarcation on the outside. Anyone can go right up to the building's facade. This reflects Switzerland's openness. Maintaining this was an important part of the concept. It was therefore necessary to combine two opposing aspects, maximum safety for the government and maximum openness toward its citizens. For us, it was always important for security to be a part of the overall design without it being very visible. That security checks can be carried out, that all requirements can be met technically without necessarily being obvious. When you enter the building, you notice you're being surveilled. You're in a secure area, like in an airport, but you don't get a funny feeling about it that makes your visit there a negative experience. The building represents Switzerland and one should experience it in a positive way. Berlin, Potsdamer Platz, an historic location in the heart of the city. Newly built after German reunification in Europe's largest inner city construction project. Our goal was to recreate a heart for Berlin. The wall was only 100 meters from here, and we had the death strip here. It was a desert. After reunification in 1990, the Berlin municipal government turned over the rebuilding of the square to private investors, who implemented their own concept of a high-rise city. With their purchase, the investors not only developed and constructed the streets and squares, they also acquired the rights of passage for the public space. It is the investors who ultimately decide who is allowed to be here. Potsdamer Platz was actually once the heart of Europe. We had the busiest streets, with the first traffic light ever built in Germany, or in Europe for that matter. Potsdamer Platz was really vibrant. The press district was nearby. The famous Haus Vaterland, hotels, great music halls, cinemas. It was a really lively place. After 9-11, things changed quite a bit. Everyone became more cautious. For example, when finding an object somewhere. Quite a lot has changed. But we still strive to be open to the public. This is always a difficult balancing act. What's necessary in terms of safety and sealing off? And where would this destroy our concept for attracting people to come here? Can a public space be planned? The question of isolation or openness, especially at the intersection of private and public urban space, is also a safety issue. Security is a matter of feeling. There's an objective kind of security and a subjective sense of it. We determined that there are actually very few things which give a person a sense of safety. The first one is cleanliness. 
It must be light, and there can't be any dodgy areas. Our staff have to be present, which they are. All this gives an objective and subjective feeling of security, without requiring a lot of electronics. The scarcity of cameras here compared to public spaces in other cities has much to do with the German fear of surveillance. Many are skeptical because of the excessive control measures during the Nazi period and by the Stasi during East German times. In daily life, however, few people care whether a shopping center is public or private and how many surveillance cameras are watching them. Their only desire is to shop at their leisure. Often we don't realize just how vulnerable crowded places are until an accident or attack disturbs the peace. Ambushes. The perpetrators are odd loners, driven by their hatred of the government. Others are religious fanatics. Can a society protect itself against the incalculable? How should it react to attacks? With retaliation? Or like the citizens of Norway and Spain, who opted for freedom and openness? London, 2005. On July the 7th, four bombs explode. Three in underground trains, one in a double-decker bus. The result, 56 deaths and 700 injuries. The attack is not from the outside, nor from the air. The four young assassins are Muslims, three of them born in the UK. A traumatic experience for the metropolis. In the blink of an eye, the entire city fell out of step. Its vulnerability visible to all. These things live on in the collective memory. They become sources of mourning and, memor and they have formal memorials and so on. But this is nothing actually new. You know, London has a 2,000 year history of uh, disaster, of plague, of war, um, of strife. So there is a pragmatic culture to this city, um, as with many other cities, that you, know, you grieve, you mourn, you go through trauma and shock, and then life goes on. And what is the alternative? Does everyone just stay at home um, and bunker themselves off from the future of their world and their life and their city? It's not an option. The police quickly identified the perpetrators and their accomplices, naturally with the help of surveillance cameras. In a second series of attacks 14 days later, an innocent man was shot, Jean-Charles de Meneses. He had dark skin and was reportedly wearing a thick jacket with wires hanging from it as he fled. But the video shows he did not flee. The cameras could prevent neither the bomb attacks nor the death of an innocent man. The bombs of 2005 and more than 20 years of IRA threats have led to an all-pervasive architecture of security. Diverse obstructions guard against trucks laden with explosives. Reinforced concrete barriers camouflaged as flower boxes and benches. While working on their project Ring of Steel, Henrietta Williams and George Gingell also discovered how urban space is transforming in another, different way. This would have been a public street, like a public road, and it's now been sold to a developer and it's become privatised space. So the, the actual like, landscape begins to completely change. And what you have in these spaces is they are policed by private security guards. Um, and although you have the right to walk down it, they can actually choose to exclude you. So you have these like, strange places that begin to, to um, become parts of the city that aren't 
wel are, aren't welcoming to most people. They're not spaces to linger in. And the whole idea is just for, you know, people to walk through, to get somewhere. And it, it becomes about being a consumer or a worker. And anyone that's outside of that gets kind of airbrushed out. You're you walk in, you're presented with sort of charming uh, flowers which are changed every few weeks and a big sign saying all the things that you must under no circumstances do. <laughs> so I think what's really interesting about it is that visually it, it ends up looking like an architectural render. It's not real life, it's not the kind of grit of the city of the melting pot. It's like a very sanitised version. It becomes a sort of non-place. Private rather than public. Here, civil rights apply only until the private investor chooses to deny access. How many of these non-spaces can a city endure? And where can one lead a free urban life in such a controlled space? The degree to which um, the politics and geographies of some cities, and perhaps many cities, are starting to re assemble some of the sort of medieval structures of um, enclaves of power with barrier zones and access control zones and of course instead of the big massive stone structures of the medieval military architecture we now have systems based on electronic passage control, electronic access, biometric scanning. Um, some people are suggesting that perhaps the airport is the paradigm space of the future city, that maybe cities in the future might have airport-style restrictions generalised across uh, the whole landscape. London's Canary Wharf. When the financial markets were deregulated, banks expanded. In the former Docklands, they could implement a remarkably elaborate security concept. Today, more than 70,000 people work in Canary Wharf. There are hotels and apartments, and a popular shopping mall. It's a new scale of privatised space. It's a very tightly defended and highly privatised idea of, of the city, which has come under a lot of criticism as being a sort of enclave of powerful and wealthy groups literally separated off from the rest of the city, almost by medieval moats using the water systems of the docklands. The access roads to the city within a city are secured by checkpoints. A private security service can deny access without reason at any time. Is this the city of the future? accessible only to the wealthy and powerful who fit into this brave new world. So the legal aspects of this are really important. That means that the owners of this space define what is legally allowed and what is prohibited through their own bylaws, their own legal sanctions, which means that political activity is, is actually illegal in this space. It's illegal to have a political demonstration. It's illegal to have a political mobilization. It's illegal to beg. It's illegal to um, do all of the, the full range of activities that you would expect to be um, allowed in a democratic society. A 3D model of the city, designed by the German Aerospace Institute in Berlin to simulate urban development. From a simulation of the real city to the creation of a virtual parallel urban environment. A future in which computers communicate with other computers, without people. Where an Internet of Things develops. Florian Michaelis from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich is working on the realization of the ubiquity of computers. 
a combination of physical objects in virtual space, the Internet of Things. What we mean is really the spreading of the Internet from computers into the real world to include real objects, products and things. This could begin with products that simply have a number on them to find out where something is. This could be products with sensors on them. It could also apply to automobiles in order to register location data and gather information from it. Actually, the integration of various properties, objects, even humans, in order to be able to to offer more services and new applications to them based on the information gathered. Here we've implemented an application which enables me to see which apps are being used here in the city. If I pan over this way, I can see, for example, that 2.2 kilometers from here, the Swiss Federal Railways app was downloaded two hours ago. I can now download this app and install it on my phone. The idea is to be able to find useful apps in the parallel world that are related to the city here. Already we are surrounded by digital services, small bundles of energy that can be made visible. And with each application, we leave behind footprints which can be collected and used. An electronic book loan, practical, quick and easy. The book is equipped with a chip the rental fee and the loan duration are registered. With the push of a button, each book's readers can be seen. So what if someone is interested in books about terrorism or chemistry? Who else knows this and might consider it suspicious? Cities are basically run by computer systems now, in the West especially. Everything that people do in a city generates data. Even driving around the city is increasingly monitored by computer systems. Moving around, um, even walking, if you have a smartphone, generates a track through GPS systems and geographical mapping systems whether we can also add credit card transactions, we can add the CCTV systems on the street, etc., etc., etc. So it's been called a data tsunami, if you like, the idea of massive waves of data being collected, not by humans, really, but by computers. Normally, we associate surveillance with police and security services. We forget that the major internet platforms and providers are also trying to follow our every step. The magic word is data mining. Sophisticated programs comb through the streams of data worldwide in search of specific criteria, which can then be used to create market-based records. At Goldsmith College in London, researchers are examining the interplay between digitalization and society. Matthew Fuller and Martin Feutz are analyzing the workings of search engines and their role in everyday life. The more and more computing is brought into um, at people's everyday lives, the more and more it can be broken up into smaller and smaller parts, discrete parts, and then reassembled uh, as and, and analysed on the basis of um, its correspondence with different kinds of uh, abstract patterns. And that's kind of what we found is, is, is an example of this kind of reconstitution of the person in uh, the digital era. In their work, How Google Decides What We See, the researchers demonstrate how Google evaluates search queries in very specific ways. If you look at the search interface, there is actually no indication that this is happening. So usually people don't know this, this is going on, that their search results are being filtered and how. 
Fuller and Foitz were the first to discover that Google analyzes and personalizes its users' data, changing it at will. As we process the search query for one of these philosophers, we simultaneously processed one for what we call an anonymous user. The anonymous user received offers for mass tourism. The philosopher's offers for tours in the upper price segment. Does this mean that not everyone receives the same offers despite the same search query? Are computers deciding who travels where? Are we already predictable through and through? Are we unknowingly being stigmatized and sorted out? Fuller and Feutz's research shows that Google makes decisions for users without their even realizing it. We need to understand these not simply as kind of repressive forces that kind of lock people into place, but also that they produce new kinds of ways of uh, being together in cities. And that uh, is why we think um, search engines, and especially coupled with locative services or um, urban urban based computing or ubiquitous computing all of these need to be uh, rethought in terms of how they they're understood as part of the public space and that citizens are able to take part in the design and reflection on these on these systems how can citizens participate in the design of these systems when developments in the digital parallel world are taking place at breakneck speed Citizens are both users and products alike. The more specific the information gained about an individual, the more valuable the data becomes. How can we grasp the full extent of the digital penetration into our lives? In Berlin, Sandro Geiken is conducting research into the freedom of information, technology and war, especially cyber war. He advises government institutions in Berlin and Brussels. There was another revolution in microelectronics, which went almost completely unnoticed. The whole area of sensors. We've made incredible, massive developments in sensor technology. Together with the information revolution, this sensor revolution has produced a general cognitive sphere in our technical environment. These technical environments are now able to monitor, record and process the information they gather. Drones as helpers in extreme situations. The combination of optical, chemical and infrared sensors enables not only the visualization of situations in real time and 3D, but also the analysis of hazardous substances. Ideal for firefighters, rescue services, disaster relief forces and the military. Sensors also facilitate virtual tracking through face recognition. This can already be observed in the internet. Visitors at the Glastonbury Festival were captured in a large group photo, which remained online long after the festival was over. Through the use of tags, individuals could be identified and approached via Facebook. The page was one of the most popular on the internet for quite some time. But what does this have to say about the experience? Does the festival continue only in the parallel universe of the internet? Do we live in multiple realities simultaneously? Face recognition can also be used in an entirely different dimension. Cameras and sensors are capturing people and scanning them for suspicious physiological signs. The aim, to detect hostile intentions before the suspect can cause harm. This is really important, because I can put it to extensive use for security measures. Basically, I can attach a policeman, in other words a camera, to any technical device which can process IT. I can put chips into all kinds of equipment in a specific environment and increase security enormously. But this is, of course, also a threat to personal liberty. 
security or freedom. The EU is funding a program to develop an intelligent information system to support surveillance, search and capture for the safety of citizens in an urban environment. Increasingly now there are efforts to use computers to bring together all sorts of items of data every time uh, an airline ticket is booked. I think in the UK now, by law, you have, they have to collect 53 separate pieces of information from all sorts of different sources um, to, to, to profile that information and to assess the degree of risk. So this is very much again a question of building data from the past to make judgments in the present about the potential future risk straight out of Minority Report, if you like. If different recording systems are interconnected to form a comprehensive monitoring apparatus for preventive police work, who controls the search criteria or the computers and sensors? and to make a judgment about what might be considered normal in somewhere like London, which is a big question. Everything is normal in London. <laughs> um, but what happens is they use the data mining systems to try and build a sense of the normality of the city, uh, which is then used to try and assess things that are unusual. And I think that's where the politics of the city increasingly lie, based on who judges what is normal in a city like London. Who judges what is abnormal in a city like London? That's a very political question. Today, security means the security of cities. In New York, the attack came from the air. In London, from underground and the street. While these are still possible, it's more likely the city will be attacked by computers, disrupting the supply of electricity, water and food. Theoretically, if the IT fails, if someone attacks the IT centers in some areas, it would have catastrophic consequences, especially in cities. The food supply would instantaneously collapse. Everything is time to market. No one has a larder anymore. No one would know where to find food. Communication systems would break down. There would be no water because the pumps couldn't operate without electricity. Within a few days, the city would degenerate into a primitive state because no one would have the resources to feed themselves, to communicate or anything else. This is an enormous risk. A silent attack on a city without leaving a trace? This may sound like science fiction, but it's already on the minds of hackers, criminals and terrorist groups. Armies are also gearing up for cyber war. During times of peace, these cyber war units ponder what to do. If there's no war going on and I've got forces that can go anywhere and do anything, then naturally I'll use them to attack other economies. I can pursue economic political objectives. I can conduct massive industrial espionage at such a high level that it can't even be detected. I can engage in sabotage. These units can sabotage an entire production and cause stock prices to plummet. I can then buy up stocks cheaply. Or I can attack the stock exchanges directly and tamper with the prices. From an IT perspective, the stock markets are gigantic, incredibly complex monsters. They'd never notice a skilled attacker in their midst. And the attackers know this. That's what makes the whole situation really attractive to them. What could happen is that these cyber war components, which are simply there, will start a secret economic war. I consider this quite plausible because there are no means for identifying the attackers. There's no need to fear diplomatic repercussions or missiles from the United States. No one can protect themselves against these skilled attackers. Everything is being offered to them on a silver platter. I'm sure there will be more developments in this direction.
Images of a world fading away. The boisterous stock market was yesterday. Today, more than 50% of the US stock trade is handled electronically from computer to computer, algorithm to algorithm. Humans are much too slow for such transactions. From my perspective, these IT security issues could be a reason to abolish stock exchanges altogether, because I can't guarantee that what's shown there represents the real value of companies. In the next attack on the financial world, no towers will fall. Yet the entire city will collapse and degenerate into chaos. The attacker will come silently through the financial industry's own arteries, its hyper-fast networks. We won't notice until after the fact. If we notice at all, it will be too late. What good is all this security if the fear of terrorism transforms our cities and society beyond recognition? If we're reduced to wandering through militarized security zones? If our longings to live together in a city make us a security risk? How many liberties must we sacrifice to overcome our fears?